Hi, everyone. Welcome to Expo North Digital Shorts. I'm so excited to have Vilborg here. Vilborg, you are a producer of film and photography in extreme Arctic environments and founder and editor in chief of the Journal of the North Atlantic and Arctic Magazine. I mean, both those things individually would be great, but combined, that's pretty cool. Hello. Hi there, uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, yes, I, I consider myself quite fortunate to, uh, to uh, have, these, uh, have these two jobs and, uh, and well, others as well, but in my, in my background, but it, it sort of comes together because um, originally I was a journalist in Iceland for 12 years and uh, I was very fortunate uh, with the work environment then and the people that I had mentoring me. And uh, then after 12 years of, uh, of journalism here, um, fate kind of started connecting me to Greenland. And uh, I wasn't on my way anywhere near to become a producer. I was just going to do some PR and write some stuff and assist in uh, getting an idea going with uh, my then partner and still work partner and uh, photographer with Jonah had. And that was about uh, exploring Greenland as a location for film and photography. At the time, and this is, you know, I feel really old when I say this, but at the time I was getting phone calls. There was this publication called Shot in the advertisement uh, world. And I remember we spent a fortune on all kinds of filming that went on for months. At the same time as we were exploring with two Inuit hunters, local Inuit hunters in East Greenland that are still working with me, um, if this was feasible. Because when you come to Greenland, it doesn't matter where you look to the left or the right or the front or the back, it's all fantastic. And the light is fantastic. And uh, Can you, for people who haven't been there, because you have an amazing <laughs> wall of photos that I, I know people are going to be very distracted by, can you describe to us because you know if people go on some of these pictures or, or no actually can you just well, describe to us what it's like to be there what how what does it feel like what does it look like well it's uh the best thing is for people just to go into jonah j-o-n-a-a dot org and just see it because our publication um is built on well, I'll, I'll come to that later, but a part of that is doing, um, out, is going outstanding photography. And we, it's all ours. It's all our people. It's all Jonah people with 20 people around this uh, magazine, web magazine. And uh, all the pictures come from us. And we have some of the world's best Arctic photographers on board. So uh, it's, it's really undis impossible to describe. It's, you feel so small. It's so big and everything is so big. The mountains are so tall, they, the, the waters are so deep because they go on and on for kilometers. Um, the distances are so long. The only thing that's not huge in Greenland is the population. They're, 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 they're just close to 60,000 people. So, um, I'm not hearing you, Jessica, now. Oh, yeah, no. If I, if I talk, then the camera okay. goes back okay. to me. Yeah, sure. So um, it's, uh, it's an incredible place um, of the planet, and it's an incredible privilege to have worked there for so long and to have um, all these connections. Um, I mean, I even have a Greenlandic daughter, so... <laughs> But that's, uh, that's, you know, one of the big, uh, big bonuses of, of all my Greenland work. But um, you also no, are an innate storyteller. You're someone who I'm sure sees that landscape and feels yeah. the stories. And, and everyone should go and check out Joan Online because it is really quite extraordinary. What are some of the stories right now that you've been working on that you think are worth um, of talking about? Well. The story that we just published is is uh, actually a policy story, and that sort of caters to a certain part of our audience. We actually have quite a big audience in universities. We just see that on our analytics. 
So um, we just published a story uh, yesterday about, um, yet again, why there is no Arctic Treaty when this is one of the most important parts of the planet, um, both geopolitically but also socially, because people tend to forget that there are a lot of people who live in the Arctic, and they also tend to forget that there are not just indigenous people who live in the Arctic, right? I the, didn't know that. The normal people in the Arctic are, are actually, a lot of them in, in Russia, in, in Canada, and, uh, okay. and in Alaska. So, um, well, so another story that uh, we published quite recently was just going around this high north area uh, and just figuring out how people were doing in the times of COVID. Uh, because we have all this horrible news from the big populated places where people are living in such density. And then we have these gorgeous parts of the planet up north where we are all sort of in, you know, peace and quiet. And we all, social distancing is really not a problem. That's true. And, uh, and you know, you feel, oh, that, that's, that's going to be no big deal for those guys up in the north. But then when you start calling them, and I was doing a part of this myself. And I thought, you know, it's going to be a few phone calls and, you know, or a few Zoom calls. And I'll uh, probably people will say pretty much the same. But then you had um, very different um, things that people were facing. And, um, and those were things like, for instance, a Greenland reporter um, um, living in Kaltikaino, which is Sami, Norway. And having to watch her dad's funeral on uh, on Facebook Live, mm. right? Mm. And uh, you had the people who had gone away from an island where they go to work at a time when nobody was really thinking about Corona. It happened to foreign people in faraway places and all that. And then they went to Reykjavik for uh, a week to just gather the things and go back. And uh, when they came back to the small island in the north of Iceland, everyone was scared of them. There had been people coming from Italy, local inhabitants. They just went straight into quarantine, but these guys were just coming back from Reykjavik. Wow. And all of a sudden, so you know, and, and there were several other, other things. Um, we have a big connection to Maine in Maine. Jonah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, there were some really, really interesting things going on there. And uh, we actually have a big connection to Scotland as well. Do you? What, what is the connection to Scotland? That's so nice to hear. Well, we have, we have Scottish people in the Jonah original group. That's great. And uh, can I pause you again? Yes. You can, you can put me back on. So um, let me just tell you a little bit about how Jonah came about. Please. Because this social distancing, or I think it's called uh, social... Um, Physical distancing. No, it's, it's, uh, I'm just trying to remember the, the headline of that article and I can't, but anyway. Um, diaries from a socially distanced north. That was the, what I was trying to say. But that is a very good example of the Jonah concept because um, it starts in 250, well, actually it starts in 2012 when I write an email that I still have. Uh, to uh, three women, one in Greenland, two in Iceland, and uh, say like, hey guys, uh, should we maybe come together and make a little nice cultural web about North Atlantic something something, Iceland, Greenland, Faroe Islands, something something, uh, something that we can be really proud of, um, you know, when we're in the rocking chair at the old folks home later in life. And that's how it began. And we were just thinking something really nice, small, cultural, uh, but um, just after I'd written that email, um, I and Clean Johannesdottir, who was uh, my Jonah partner and founder, uh, we were asked to um, to produce a, uh, the Nordic cultural event of 2014, which was this huge, big youth um, cultural project that took two years in preparations and almost a month wow. to execute and went over uh, 
six countries in 15 workshops. So anyway, the, the little nice cultural project was just sort of put on the shelf. But uh, then before we finished the other one, this came up in a meeting that we had with um, an institution of the Arctic Council called NORA. And NORA is like the North Atlantic business part of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as, a, you know, as, a, as an extra sentence somewhere in, in conversation about something totally different. And the then uh, um, chairman of, of them says, well, this is something that we would like to hear more about. And uh, we have an application run come up, and I think you guys should apply for this. And we're like, but we're just about, you know, we've got six more months in, in that, and we don't really have a time as well. Just write us a little bit so we at least know about it, and then you can, you know, apply again later if, if it's too little. So we write an application, and we got the money we asked for. And we phoned back and said, can we please not get the grant until we're finished? And uh, so in the end of that year, this is the end of 2014, um, we were given this grant from Nora to basically figure out if this concept that we had was feasible to do, if it made sense. So the concept was this, and of course it's you know been molded and shaped since. Uh, but the original concept of Jonah was that we would focus on all the countries that shared shores of the high North Atlantic Ocean. And what combines us? Because that ocean sort of combines us, right? That's nice. We've all lived from it, we've all, you know, we've all sailed with the, its lighthouses in view, we've, uh, our economies have developed from it. Our endurance in life from the harshness, from the threat of death and mm -hmm. all those things that, that come with being a fishing nation. We were all poor. We we're all poor nations originally. And um, so that was sort of the original concept. So there must be a culture that connects us and we should do more business together. We should do more, you know, join our, our academia more together. Lovely. And that kind of, kind of a view. So we spent that first grant basically going around, introducing the idea, talking to all kinds of people and, and, and starting to weave a net and figuring out, is this really, is this just something that we think is fantastic? Or is this something that people actually find valid? Yeah. So fast forward, um, we launched in 2017. We really thought we were going to launch a year earlier. Mm -hmm. But um, everyone was like, let's just wait, because this is something that we want to do. We're all doing something else. We're all making a living from doing something else. Let's just be really slow and focused on getting this up, on ticking into all the boxes that we've said we want to do, figuring out what's feasible, what's not. So this is how Jonah, this is the platform that Jonah uh, starts on. And uh, our connections are very, very solid and good, and they're very dedicated. Mm -hmm. And when I say like Maine, it's, uh, you know, we've been with, uh, with, uh, with Maine at the same time as Maine, which interestingly is, feels much more like the North Atlantic than it ever does like America. And yeah. I've been all over America, so I know. I'm from New England. I would agree with yeah, you. No, yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, it, it, if anything, it feels more like you, you're with Canadians. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, it's just North Atlantic people and the way they think and the way they view life. So uh, it's been fantastic to see how Maine has really grown towards Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Scotland, Ireland, Beautiful. Denmark. And, uh, and, you know, that's really been the, the work of a fairly small group of people who have just been positioned in the right places. And can one I, can of I, them can I ask a very practical question mm -hmm. for people at home who are going to be like, how do you even start something like this? And because you're someone who also works in what they call extreme environments, so um, which is not easy. You have to have an adventurous spirit and um, be pretty resilient and flexible. When you're running an online, like a magazine, how much, how much um, in reserve do you have? 
pictures, stories, and how much are you living on a knife's edge of publishing, gathering, and publishing and gathering? Um, it's a bit of both. I mean, we have, we have no small black book. We have a big black book, okay? And uh, the, the, the foundation of why we have been able to publish, as we said from the beginning, uh, that we would, um, was, okay, I'm going to boast a little bit. A year and a half ago, I was in Tromsø at a conference called the Arctic Frontiers. And there was a certain uh, senator from the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I was, we were introduced. And it's like, and this is Wilbur, I'm not going to tell you the name. This is Wilbur, um, she's the editor of Jonah. And I'm just about to pitch, you know, the, the record. And Jonah is da 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 da. And that person says, uh, I know Jonah, it's, it's those fantastic pictures. You like the National Geographic of the North. Oh, awesome. I, I didn't touch the crowd for a day. But I mean, if this is how people view us, then half of our um, mission is accomplished in terms of what we are. Yeah. So we, everything we do is based on outstanding visual language and it's pictures that you do not get anywhere else. No. It's pictures that belong to us or our photographers. One of us was behind the camera of every single picture with one exception. The only exception is uh, I, I interviewed Nicholas Sturgeon once <laughs> about Scotland and the Arctic, and uh, I was lacking a picture of the Parliament. <laughs> That's the only picture in Jonah that we have actually bought from a foot of um, really? a photo. Yep. That's very funny. <laughs> very funny, and uh, and yeah. So for you have, you, you, you have such an amazing collection of talents because you understand stories, you know how to produce, and clearly you understand what makes a good picture. For, so for a lot of the artists and photographers who will be watching this, what for you makes a good image? What, how, why does a picture work and some don't work? What works for me is um, if, it, if it gives me... I mean, I'm going to say this with one thing first. I'm not an ordinary picture editor. I'm so overspoiled, and that's not from Jonah only. That's just throughout my career, I've, I've been working with incredible photographers. A lot of them are on Jonah as well now. So I really have been spoiled, okay, in terms of visual language. But... Um, for me, for a picture to work, it, it has to touch something. And uh, it has to somehow make me want to, even if it's not a, if it's, if it's a tragic one, it still has to give me some kind of a feeling of, I should be, I could be, I want to be there. Oh, lovely. That's really the, yeah, that's sort of the easiest way for me to, explain what touches me but i mean of course i i can see fantastic frames that don't touch me but for me to really um yeah that's that's the kind of uh that's lovely that is so lovely and do you know we didn't get it completely into it in the interview but you are someone who in their background are so well traveled you you learn different languages um with ease uh you're not a native icelandic speaker but you know, clearly, we paused the interview. And I, I, I'm, I'm a native fluid. Icelandic speaker. Yeah. Icelandic is my mother tongue. Yes, that's, yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, and, but you know English as well, clearly. And are there any other languages that you, you speak? No, well, I could, I could probably say my life in Spanish from the old days, but yeah. I have to admit, and I could say my life in Danish, which is only because I'm not clever enough to learn and I hate myself for not having done that but I really have not managed to learn Greenlandic and that's horrible to say after 23 years of being in that country and uh, I can still sit beside people and I have because it's so alien to every other language in the world which is one of the things that makes it uh, so interesting yeah. 
and uh, it has a different vocabulary, it's differently thought. And um, we, uh, I'm just doing an interview, so you've got to pause here, okay? <laughs> Again, this was clean, clean. Actually, I'm gonna, while you pause, I'm gonna, hang, okay. on, hang on a second. So I wanna know if your original premise, the intention that you set out with, which is looking oh. at what kind of connects oh. that region, um, have you found that there is more that connects us than oh. divides us? It's, uh, there is something about this, the personalities that get raised up north. Mm. Um, so it has something has to do with the spaces we enjoy. Something has to do with the fact that we are more aware than maybe many others that we are in such limited control of our nature. Yeah. It rules us. And uh, that's something that people really need to, to sort of get back to the basics of. Yeah. Um, of course, we're all fairly okay in terms of education. We're all fairly okay in terms of female rights. Yeah. But uh, we're not there yet, and there is a difference. And the thing is that what can't be overlooked is that the indigenous populations of the High North, um, I've seen it in Siberia, I've seen it in Norway, I've seen it in, in, in Greenland, I've yet to see it in Alaska, I haven't been there yet. But um, we tend to... Um, sort of okay someone's gonna hate me for saying this we, we tend to regard them sometimes as museum pieces mm -hmm. that these are like museum human museums of cultures that we want to preserve and they should just stay as they are but they shouldn't kill the seals and they shouldn't shoot the red deer yeah you know yeah yeah and and this is uh this is crazy because these are incredible cultures that can teach mm -hmm. us so much more yeah. than any others about how to live alongside nature in this world and keep things in harmony. But they need to have access to education. They need to have access to like things like internet. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is that, um, for instance, my, my daughter, when she was in, uh, in junior college in Nuuk in Greenland, uh, she had a brother in Iceland and, um, uh, he was in, in junior college in Iceland. And I was saying this once, I was speaking um, because of this cultural thing. I was speaking to some uh, people working in the Nordic ministries. And I took it as an example. And I said, well, she has to be really careful. Uh, she's got the biggest plan that's available by mm -hmm. Telegreenland of internet. But she really cannot wander or browse around all she wants because then it's just going to be so expensive when her brother can do YouTube on his laptop and something else on his uh, phone and the third thing on his uh, iPad. Mm -hmm. And he can have all of them going 24 hours every day of the month. And we don't really see a dent in our home budget. No, that's a very good point. So this is horrible because at the same time, we have these small nations, whether they are up in Igaluit, or, or in other places in Canada and North, Northwest Territories, or in Greenland, or up in Siberia. And we want these people to nourish the, um, the, uh, their wisdom and their culture yeah. that has so much to give to us now when we're sort of trying to regain a connection to how to go around with nature. Yeah. And... Uh, but we want them to be educated. We need them to be yeah. educated because yeah. otherwise they have to do like in Greenland where every other middle management in the country and somebody's going to hate me for saying that as well comes from Denmark. Yes, totally. And, and that shows, I'm sorry, that there are some wonderful people from Denmark, but a lot of them would have been so much nicer to see an educated Greenlander there. Yeah, so okay. they, need a, they need access. They need, they just need encouragement, access, they need so much more. And it doesn't, it cannot just start on a university level. It has to start much, much earlier. Yeah. But the thing is, if we just look at the, um, at the uh, university level, we're all small countries, Greenland, Iceland, and the Faroe Islands. Right? Yeah. 
And we have some fantastic educational institutions that yeah. could be shared by all three. Um, so like we That's have a, nice uh, a like polar, polar law uh, studies in Aquaria, in the uh, University of Aquaria. And we have a, a really good, um, it's designed for people who work in fishing, whether they're running companies or, or running vessels or whatever, or, or doing the processing thing. And it's a very, very high standard education here in Iceland. This is all available online, right? Mm. So people from uh, the Faroe Islands and from Greenland can do it and are encouraged to do it, but the Faroese people do it fine. They use it a lot. But the people in Greenland who want to use it, they're going to go bankrupt. If they have to follow lessons online, let's say four days a week for two hours. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it's, yeah. it's, I mean, people talk about, you know, all these kinds of visions. We should join hands and work better together. And we can, and we have the institutions, we have the connections, we have the political connections between the countries. But at the end of the day, it comes down to practical methods. People have to be able to afford it. Right. And this is the same thing with health. We mm -hmm. need to see so many changes of health in the high north, not just indigenous health, but, but things like mental health is a serious, serious problem. And I remember when I asked um, Okalik Esir, who was a former um, ICC chair, she is a woman from, from, uh, from Canada, from Igaluit, whom I highly adore. And I asked her to come on board uh, the Jonah Advisory Board, and this is in 2016. And uh, she said to me, "Well, I've, I'm being asked to join a lot of board people, so let me just think about this." And then she, we had made this beautiful book mm -hmm. with visions and texts and all that. Nobody, it's so it's so great and it's so well printed. Nobody throws it away. So that was our promo piece of material, and I'd given that to her. And then she came back to me and said, "You know, I'll look, I'll look at this." If you promise me that Jonah is not just going to be about dog sledding under the Northern Lights, mm -hmm. I'll join. <laughs> if you promise me that you're going to do pieces that do not ignore the fact that we have children who are underfed in Canada, we have people with serious mental problems yeah. who are five, six, seven hundred kilometers away from any help, yeah. then I'll join. If you just please do not romanticize yes. the Arctic. Yes. Yeah. With so, real, real, real stories, the real needs, yeah, yeah. voices. That's, that's wonderful. I really hate to say this, but we are so running out of time, over time. But there's so much more to say, um, I'm sure, and hear from you guys. We'll include all the links below. Can we leave with a little bit of wisdom or advice from, that you've learned along the way? Um, um, that we may be able to take into our, our daily lives or our daily working lives. Oh my God, that's, um, that's a huge question. It is a huge question. Well, it's, uh, it's just, you know, view, view your environment with empathy and tolerance and then everything works out. And I think those, you know, what's oh, happening in the US now and what's been happening oh. with COVID, this is, this is, and this is what you learn when you approach people that are so different, that speak different languages, that think differently because they structure their thoughts differently. This is at the end of the day, and a smile is always the best one. That's wonderful, Ms. Bilberg. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to hopefully getting you over to Scotland at some point soon. Yep. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.